Good morning. It's good to see you here today. So happy to be back after a couple weeks of vacation and just being back here in the United States. It's good to be home again and so good to be here uh, with all of you today to worship God and just to praise his holy name and to uh, come with rejoicing. I want to uh, say hello to any guests that we have here today. If I haven't met you yet, I'm happy uh, that you're here and hope I get a chance to meet you. And also want to say hello to those of you online today, wherever you are. I hope that God is blessing you on the Sabbath day and I uh, want to thank you for joining us from afar. So Stephanie had mentioned that we're going to be doing a discipleship study Um, If you haven't done the discipleship study, I really want to encourage you to do it. It's a wonderful study that goes through basic practices and beliefs of a Christian. And so in Hebrews 6, it talks about fundamental doctrines, things such as repentance from dead works, faith toward God, baptism, laying out of hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And what it does is it weaves in those doctrines with basic practices of a Christian that would include prayer and worship, Bible study, fasting, fellowship, good works, and meditation that we're going to be talking about here today. But it is a Bible study that goes through and and basically gives you daily assignments that have prayer, Bible study, and meditation incorporated into it as you go through these topics. And so it is a 10-week commitment, but if you're interested, please let uh, Stephanie know when she sends the email out, or we'll have a list coming up, and we'll try to choose a date uh, that makes sense for us to be doing that Bible study. But uh, again, if you haven't done it, I'd encourage it, and if you want to do it again, do it again. There's no limit. You can come as many times as you want. And uh, I have done that study probably a good 12 times or so, and uh, I always am enriched by it. Because the, the fact of the matter is much of our life and our growth with the Lord is based on those fundamental beliefs and those fundamental practices. And that's why we're going to talk about one today. How many of you would think of meditation as being a Christian thing? All right. How many of you would think of it more as being a non-Christian religious thing? All right, a couple of you. So you think about meditation, you think about what it is. You might have different thoughts in your mind. It might be sitting down and crossing your legs and um, and thinking of, no, you don't think about it that way? Okay, but some people do. You just, you know, everybody's got their own ideas about meditation, but I want to talk about meditation today from a biblical standpoint and talk a little bit about why it's important and and what we can uh, gain from this practice. And so this is a fundamental Christian practice that you see talked about both in the Old Testament and the New Testament that I want to talk with you about today. So what is meditation? So what I did was I took the Hebrew words and the Greek words and I brought, broke it down into this. Basically, it means to speak to yourself. It means to think, to consider, to ponder, to dwell on an idea or thought, speaking within your own heart, in your own mind, even talking or singing in your heart, and musing upon a concept. And, and what God wants us to be doing is meditating on certain things that we're going to talk about today, but it's important to understand that there's an enrichment that goes on that we need to understand in the way God designed us. God designed you to think. I don't know if you ever thought about that or meditated on that concept. But God designed you to think. And one of the things that's a challenge is that our world is very cluttered. And our world probably now is more cluttered than mankind has ever seen it. There is just so much to clutter the world Thinking goes away. You know, it used to be when I would travel, I would go to a restaurant, I would be by myself, I didn't have a cell phone. What did you do at dinner when you were by yourself? Thought. You know, you go for a walk, you would think. You go to the park, you think. You're waiting at an airport for a flight, you would think. With cell phones now, you always have something in your hand to tell you what to think. It's always feeding you data and feeding you information, and it it can be very cluttering in life how much information we're taking in, but how much do we actually sit and ponder and think and meditate and actually take a time to quiet ourselves? And it's really a a very powerful thing because when you quiet your mind, you realize how many things try to invade that space. And you also realize how many things want to challenge your thinking. But God gave you the ability to choose life 
God gave you the ability to think about your life and to think about him and his life and to spend time pondering this. And what happens is what you think about is essentially what you become. Every belief that you have started with a thought, an idea. You heard the gospel, right? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You hear God's word, you meditate, you think about it, and from that comes a belief. And so you are constantly creating beliefs, and those beliefs come either from God and his word or from the world in its world, a word to you that you hear through everything that comes into your life. There's always somebody trying to gain your attention, right? Buy this car, buy this product, have this nutritional item. I mean, we are inundated with thoughts, and those thoughts are trying to compel behaviors. And God's word will compel behaviors when we think about his word, when we think about his works, when we think about who he is. And so as Christians, we need to understand that there is a tremendous battle for our hearts and our minds. And God wants us to be in submission to him and to be walking with him in his ways. And so thinking about his word, pondering, and going through some of these things we'll talk about today. So how do we meditate? Well, ultimately, it's the ability to quiet your mind from everything that can come in and think about something. So if you said, I'm going to just, I want to think about how God has forgiven me. Or I want to think about God's mercy through his son. I want to think about how God created me. Like, I can see, I can hear, I can touch, I can taste. I want to think about whatever it is. See, God wants us to be thinking and, and using our minds, and he wants us to have some intense focus on some of these beautiful things about him and his word that we'll talk about here today. So what are the things in which God wants us to meditate on, and why does he want us to meditate? So I want to begin with the first category. We're going to look at four different categories. There are more than this in the scripture, but I want to look at four main categories today. And the first one is he wants us to meditate on his goodness. Meditate on God's goodness. So the first scripture is Psalm 143, verses 5 to 6. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all your works. I muse on the work of your hands. I spread out my hands to you. My soul longs for you like a thirsty land. That's a beautiful psalm, isn't it? Just to ponder these things. I remember the works. I meditate. You know, we can look in God's word, and we, we have example after example through Scripture of how God worked with different people at different times and the works that he has done to bring about salvation, deliverance, right, to bring about peace and hope. We have works that we can read about in the Scriptures that we can meditate on, that we can bring to mind, that give us hope and strength and encouragement when we need it. And in this world, we, we constantly need encouragement from the Lord. We constantly need his help and his direction. And so we meditate on his works. But, but in your own life, if you have lived long enough with the Lord, you also can meditate on the works that he's done for you in the past. You can think about life and how God has done things in your life. You know, when uh, I moved to California 25 years ago, uh, moved out here, and my company basically got attacked by another company. It's kind of a funny story because the company uh, that was attacking my company and literally trying to put me out of business and literally coming after me was calling me. One of the leaders of the company would call me and say, hey, I, I'm going after this account, I'm taking this account. And sure enough, account after account after account, I, we ended up losing every single account we had because this company was very much targeting us, and there was a lot of things that weren't true going on. And I say it's a funny story I'm, because I ended up becoming president over that company. But it, it took a while, but when I was going through it, it was really hard. It was really hard. But the thing about it was through that time, it was gut-wrenching. I remember thinking, am I going to lose my house? How am I going to provide for my wife and my family? Here we just moved to California. California is more expensive than Illinois. And I can have all this worry about how life is going to be. And I realized something. I could make God my business partner. Do you remember how 
Jacob when he said, God, if you will do these things for me, I'll give you a tenth of everything I have. That's where tithing, you know, we know about Abraham tithing with when he won the battle and giving it to Melchizedek. But Jacob actually said, if you will bless me in my work and in my business and you will cause me to prosper, I'm going to give you a tenth of everything I have. And he made God his business partner. He was saying, God, I recognize that you're my provider and I'm recognizing I need you and I'm asking you to be my partner in life. And that concept of thinking of that work of old meditating on that helped me to realize that I had everything I needed to be successful in my work because I had God. And if I had God as my business partner, he could counsel me on what I needed to do, who I needed to talk to. He would counsel me on what creative ideas I needed to come up with. And basically, I had to reinvent a business that I had been a part of for about 10 years into something very different and something that ended up becoming very successful. And I attribute that to God being a part of my life. And through that, I learned the power of being able to shut my office door and get on my knees and say, God, I literally have no idea what to do right now, but I know that you do. And I would ask God for answers. And it was amazing how many times I would get down and literally within a minute, two minutes, five minutes of just saying that prayer, God would give me the answer. God was able to give me creative thinking to develop things that would make me successful in my life that were in accordance with his ways and his principles, and now I have that testimony. So when I wonder about what to do, I can remember back to the works of old that 25 years ago, and all this is going on in my life, I prayed to God and he answered me. He gave me what I needed to do something and to watch it grow and to develop. And what he did was he took something that was looking like it was being destroyed, and what he did was build up my faith through my business, and then the business took off, my life and faith took off, and there I have been with God ever since. But I know about this, and in my experience with him, is something I can draw on, looking at the past and saying, God, I see the way you worked. Now, if you work this way in my business, can you work this way in other ways too? So meditating on how God has blessed us, how God has helped us, can be so important. So when he talks about, I remember the days of old, I meditate on all your works, I muse on the works of your hands. I want you to think about that in terms of biblical things, in terms of other stories from people's lives and their testimonies, and also the testimony of your own life. Will you think on that? And he says, this is a part of what he does. And notice how when he muses on the works of his hands, I will spread my hands out to you. My soul longs for you in a thirsty land. You know what's so great when you realize what God has done in your life is that it makes you hungry for him all the time. You thirst for him all the time. You hate even the thought of a life apart from God because it is empty, it is cold, it is without hope, without strength. God is wisdom. God is sanctification. God is our life and our salvation and our deliverance. And living life apart from God is a life not worth living. This is eternal life that we would know God and that we would know his son whom he sent. Life is about knowing him and walking with him and having God's spirit is what makes us children of God and to live life without his spirit leading us and guiding us, how will we ever be what God created us to be? But if we are in him, we will live and we will move and we will have our being. We will have wisdom and sanctification and justification in life because he is our God. And what he does is creative, wonderful works in our lives. And it says that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. Do you believe that? Do you meditate on that? You see, when you go through challenges in your life, God is calling for you to meditate on him and on his works. Remember who is God, and remember who is on your side, and remember who loves you, and remember who wants to deliver you, 
and remember all the things that he is capable of. He gives us all these 31,000 verses in our Bible so we can see him. It is all an invitation to come close to a God of miracles who can do above and beyond things that we can even think or imagine. And what our faith does is opens up his ability to just do wonderful things in our lives. It doesn't get there without some heartache sometimes. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had to get thrown in that fire to get that miracle that we all love to read about and how the fourth one was there with them in the flames, one like the Son of Man. It's remembering God and knowing who he is. So important. Now, in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8, it tells us to meditate. And it says, meditate on these things, things that are true, noble, just, pure, lovely, of good report, virtuous, and praiseworthy. Now, do you see anything negative in that list? Think about the worst things going on in the world. Meditate on things that are awful, that you're unhappy about. Meditate on your misery, your bitterness, how you've been sinned against. Meditate on your shame, your guilt. Do you see any instruction in this in Philippians 4.8? I want you to see it. It's not that you shouldn't think about these things, but when you're meditating, you meditate on things that are true, noble, just, pure, lovely, of good report, virtuous and praiseworthy. You meditate on God's works and his goodness because God is trying to create a culture of heart and faith and thinking in you that is greater than those things. That's the, that's the key to meditation, of realizing that what you're doing is transforming your heart by being willing to meditate on things that God has done and that God wants you to think about. Now, I want you to look at this list and I want you to pick a topic for yourself right now. We're going to do a little exercise here. So I want you to think about something that you find to be true or noble or just or pure or lovely, something virtuous of good report, praiseworthy about God, something he's done, who he is, a characteristic of him, what he has done for you. Do you have it? Does anybody not have at least one thing right now? And I want you to only choose one thing. All right, everybody's got something? Now, what I want you to do is I want you to intently focus on whatever that is that you chose. And I want you just to take some time now to think about that thing. All right, so how many of you were able for all the time I just gave you to think about that one thought and nothing else? That is really impressive. That was one minute and you thought about something for one minute and didn't let anything else in. I love that because meditation really is about that and it's the key to a breaking down of Self and all the other clutter that can want to come in to other things. Now, don't raise your hands, but how many were like 10 seconds in? They're already wondering, why is David doing this? No, nobody? The, the thing is that so much of meditation and prayer is about the ability to grab hold of your thoughts and to intently speak them, 
put them before the Lord and bring the thoughts before God. And so this is so important. Now, what was really amazing for me is I got to be up here and I got to watch. A lot of you closed your eyes and I got to see your faces. And it was amazing to me how many people actually started getting smiles on their faces as you were meditating. How many felt a a better positive feeling after taking one minute to think about something pure and of good report? It's kind of hard to feel negative when you're thinking on good, positive things. And what happens is you start to get a spirit of gratitude because you think of the goodness of God. You think about a goodness of his work or what he's done for you, and it, it produces something very positive. The more you meditate, the deeper you go and the longer you will spend in it, the more that positive attitude becomes filling your heart so that you can share that with somebody else. So that's a tremendous reason why it's so important to meditate is because it changes your heart thinking, changes what you're giving out to the world. And so the more positive you are about God, the more you're thinking of things that are true and noble and just and pure and of good report, that's what you deliver out because that's now what's filling your heart. And so talk a little bit more about that later. Next section I want to talk about is meditating on God's law and word. So this is part number two, meditate on God's law and word. Here in Joshua 1.8, it says, meditate on the book of the law day and night that you may observe to do it, for then you will be prosperous. So there's a good reason why, right? Be sure to meditate on the law day and night because then you will be prosperous. Notice here as well in Psalm 119.97, to 99, it says, your law is my meditation all the day. Your commandments make me wiser than my enemies. I understand more than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. So how do you deepen yourself as a thinker and as a believer and one who walks in faith? You meditate on God's word. The more you meditate on it, the more you understand it. God, I just love this, this part about God, and this is something I think about a lot, but God laid out his word in a way that most human beings probably wouldn't do it. Because there's like here a little, there a little. And he gives teaching and examples that are there that are meant to be dug into, right? He, he, he loves that. He, it says in the Proverbs, it's the glory of the Lord to conceal a matter. It's the glory of kings to search it out. And part of going into God's word is being willing to dig into it, not just to read over it, and and reading is great, but to think about it, to meditate on it, to grab more than what you get. So let me give you an example when it comes to meditating on God's law. One of the laws that people will read about and and will be intrigued by in, in the Old Testament is the law of clean and unclean, right? So God says, hey, Israelites, I want you to be different. You're going to only eat land animals that have cloven hooves and chew the cud. And you're only going to eat fish that has fins and scales. Now, it's easy for us to grab onto that in the letter of it and say, well, that means, you know, no more pork, no more shellfish, and, and grab onto what that is as a fleshly ordinance. But what is God wanting us to really grab when you think about worshiping in spirit and truth and keeping that law in spirit and truth? See, looking at a law physically on the, as it is on the surface, we can grab onto that and say, well, this is it. This is what I need to do. But, but what is God concerned about us consuming? What does God want us to evaluate before we take it in? And see, you, you start to think and meditate about why is it that he wants me to be selective in the things that I choose to eat, the things that I choose to consume of? And then you go, what to Jesus said? And Jesus said, hey, it's not what goes into a stomach that defiles a man, but what comes out of his heart. Well, what does come out of the heart? He says murders and adulteries and all these things that can be very vile, they can defile us. So when you start to think about life and what we really consume into our hearts, into our spirits, into our minds... That can be basically summed up by all the medias we take in, all the conversations we take in. Am I 
watching things that are impure? Am I meditating on lust or immorality or murder? Uh, you know, it's, it's amazing how many TV shows there are that get you to root for the bad guy. It's like, wow, like there's a lot of shows on TV that get you to root for bad people. But think about what that does over time as you take that in and you're eating unclean meat. It's affecting your heart. It's affecting your thinking. It's affecting your mind. And then what is it that comes out of that? Or when somebody comes and has uh, gossip and rather than going to the person that they need to talk to, they start talking about it with others. Man, sometimes that unclean meat tastes so good. I mean, look at all the magazines that we sell, all the TV shows that we sell that are nothing more than gossip. Talking about people. And, and we, we take these things in, and you look at that law and you say, wow, God, there are a lot of things that, that come into my life that I take in. Books I read, movies I watch, TV that I have, conversations that I have, things that go on at work, processes that are against you, ways that are against you that I take in. He's saying, but are you discerning whether that's worthy of your taking into your heart, into your mind? Are you thinking about what you're consuming and thinking about the effect it will have on you? God's law is very rich and very deep. And when we look at it, he writes things in the letter hoping that we will search in the spirit for the essence of the law and how it applies to things. See, the Pharisees, they were very concerned about tithing on the mint, anise, common, but they were missing justice, mercy, faith, and love. And see, in this law of clean and unclean, there is so much in our lives that we need to be discerning about and saying, Does it have scales and fins? Does it have a cloven hoof and chew the cud? He's saying, are you thinking about it and saying, is this even what I want to be eating? Spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically, how is it impacting our lives? Are we even thinking about what we're willing to meditate on and put our time to in our lives? You know, having a cupcake once in a while is a good thing. But if that's all you're eating, not so good. You have to choose some good, healthy things to make your body good and healthy. And so you have to be discerning of what that is and and realize that God wants us to be discerning about the things that we're meditating on. And here is David saying, I meditate on your law. Your commandments make me wiser. I understand more than all the teachers why because your testimonies are my meditation. I think about you and what you're thinking about. I want to embrace it. And meditation is a way that we do that. In Psalm 1, verses 1 to 3, it says, Meditate and delight in God's law day and night to be like a tree. A tree, like what, is planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in its season, whose leaf shall not wither, and also meditate on God's law day and night to prosper in whatever you do. Now, these are things that God is saying, my word is really clean food for you. This is good for you to meditate on. It's good for you to think about because what's going to come out is going to be blessing to you in the way that you live your life. And so meditate on these things. Now, I want you to notice this one, Matthew 12, verses 33 to 35. Matthew 12, 33 to 35, it says, make the tree good and its fruit good or the tree bad and its fruit bad. Brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure uh, brings forth evil things. What is in your heart? What are you treasuring? So this is where, again, when you think about the fact that God made you to think, that you get to choose what what is going on inside. But notice he says, make the tree good and its fruit good, or the tree bad and its fruit bad. But but basically, what what do you have to bring forth? If you aren't filling your heart with God's word and thinking about his law, what then are you thinking about that you have to bring forth to someone else? So 
the word and the law and the governance and the guiding principles of life, the things that you can share with others are limited by the things that you think about. If you're not thinking about it, how are you going to bring it out? He says, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. In other words, if, if you don't meditate on God's word, if you're not reading it and thinking about it and turning it over in your mind, then what do you have to deliver to anybody else? You know, I had a friend, he said, you can always tell when people are thinking about God's word when they're reading it and thinking about it because they're going to talk about it. They're always ready to talk about it. They always can talk about it because God is on their mind. But you can also tell when somebody's not because it's never a topic they're comfortable talking about. If you're not comfortable talking about God's word, if you're not talking, uh, comfortable talking about your relationship with God, are you engaged in it? And the thing is that it's, it's a simple fix. Pay attention to God. Think about God. Ask God who he is. Ask him to reveal himself. Meditate on what he says. Think about it. And the more you desire to know God's heart in his thinking, the more he's going to give it to you. And David became wiser than his enemies because he thought like God thought. David was a man after God's own heart. He, the more he was engaged with God, the more he thought like God, the more he revealed. And look at how many beautiful psalms David left for us. And most of them are musing on God. You know, when I consider the works of your hands, when I look into the heavens, when I think about this and that, David wrote and wrote, so many beautiful psalms that came out of the meditations of his heart as he thought about God's word and who God is. And that is what God desires from us, that we would bring forth songs from our heart, words from our heart that come out of us because we've been thinking about God. And so again, a beautiful practice as a Christian. Now I want to talk about the next section, meditating on God's power over sin. It says in the book of Romans that sin shall not have dominion over you. And one of the ways that we fight sin, and one of the benefits of meditation, is to uh, see God's power over sin through meditation. Psalm 119, verse 9 to 16, it says, How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed to your word. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. You ever think about that as you meditate or as you Bible study, that you can actually hide God's word in your heart so that that becomes the thought for things that you're battling against. Now, I don't know what sin you might have going on in your life, but whatever sin it is, I assure you, if it is a sin, there is a scripture that addresses that sin, that tells you the right thing to do. So if you're having issues with lying, you can read about how God hates lying. You can read about how he says don't bear false witness. You can read about what he says in both the Old and New Testament about lying. You can take those words and start to hide them in your heart, and you can start meditating on why does God not want me to lie. What are the benefits of lying versus the consequences of lying? And why would God not want liars? I don't think it's a hard thing for us to, to think about the realities of that, but part of the problem is sometimes we're fighting sin on our own word. Do you remember when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness? The devil comes with temptation. When Jesus answered the three temptations of the devil, what did he speak? The word of God, the scriptures. Because it was in his heart, he spoke exactly what he needed to say because it was in his heart. And how he defeated the temptation for those sins was by having the anecdote of the word already in his heart. For you and me, it's the same thing. We need to learn from Jesus how he defeated the enemy. When the enemy comes forth with temptation, you don't meet it in the carnal mind with carnal battle gear. It's not by white-knuckling it or being tough enough in the flesh. It is by addressing it with the word of God and saying, this is the word by which I live. I will not lie. I will not bear false witness. I will tell the truth. God hates lying. God hates false witness. He wants me to be of the truth. Just tell the truth. And so 
God can arm us for the battle when we realize that the truth will set us free. And we meditate and think about why it's just better to tell the truth than to tell a lie that probably is going to lead to another lie and it's probably going to lead to some other cover-up. And now you're living in guilt, shame, hoping you won't get caught. And here's all the stress because you just wouldn't tell the truth to begin with. Right? Anybody who can relate to that? But you meditate on God's word. You have it hidden in your heart so that it's there for you. So, again, notice that. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. How do you hide it? By reading it and meditating on it so that what you're incorporating is God's thoughts in your heart so that you think in his way and not your own. What meditation really is is the transformation of proving the will of God. It says in Romans chapter 12, he says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And he says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, proving what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You realize the more that God's mind and thoughts are dwelling in our minds, in our hearts, the more that's what's going to be expressed. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. You get that choice. But God is saying, choose good. Because if you're not making your heart good by putting in my word, hiding my word in your heart, meditating on it, what's going to come out is anything else that might be there. So how do you become somebody who brings good fruit into the world? You fill your heart and mind with God's word. You meditate on it and you bring it to bear. And it helps you defeat sin in your life because now you're walking in the spirit by the word and will of God and you're overcoming sin and the destructive ways of it. Notice in Psalm 19 verses 12 to 14 it says, who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. I love this verse because it goes back to where all sin really begins. And that is what's going on in your heart, what's going on in your mind. And so David, when he's saying this, cleanse me from secret faults. Where do the errors come from? It, it comes from what's inside. You know, none of us is sinning outwardly without it beginning as a sin inwardly. And when Jesus was talking, he said, hey, it's been said of old, you shall not murder. I say, you shouldn't even hate your brother. You've heard of old that it said, you shall not commit adultery. I'm telling you, if you've lusted after another, you've already committed adultery. He's saying, if it's going on inside, it's going on. God wants us to be of a pure heart, of a pure mind. So he's saying, meditate on my word and learn a new way. Learn what it is to be pure, to not murder your neighbor in your heart, to not commit adultery in your heart, to not defraud your neighbor in your heart. He's saying it all begins there in the heart. And the truth is that what's going on in our heart is way more than what's going on outwardly. Because we can be pretty good at hiding it outwardly, right? What, what we're thinking inside. But God is saying, I want to show you the way David was asking. Cleanse me from my secret faults, the things that are going on inside of me. I want my heart to be completely aligned with you. Meditation, the way God describes it in his word, is bringing our thoughts into alignment with him so that what we think about and what we see as a way is exactly in line with his way. That's why he wants you to do it. He's saying, I want you to think about life the way I think about life. I want you to see the world through my eyes. We call this a biblical worldview where God's word comes in and we start to see all of the things around us from his perspective and we're changed by the process of it. Notice in Psalm 139, verse 23 to 24, it says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. 
we have the ability to meditate on things that are not right in us as well and to ask God to search those things out. And part of meditation is having our fears, our anxieties, wrong thoughts bubble up so that we can deal with it before the Lord. God wants to deal with our sin. But part of this is being able to be honest about what our sins are and where our thinking is internally, what our fears are, what our anxieties are, what our lusts are, to say, here it is, God. Here it is. Now, search me out. Try me out on what's really going on and lead me in a way that is everlasting. So part of what is going on through meditation is a purging of what is not godly to put in what is godly. And as you meditate on God's word, you will see more and more where the thinking that you have with God's word isn't always aligned. And rather than running from that and feeling that's too painful and even admitting that sometimes, God, the reason I sin is because I like it, it's better to be honest to get to the point where you can say, I may like it, but that is my flesh and I choose you instead. We say yes to God and no to self when we meditate and we're saying, I want to learn your way of thinking. Because if my thinking is off with you, God, then my thinking is off. And my thinking needs to be in line with you so that I can have a heart like you have, which is loving and kind and peaceful and filled with joy. And so the question is, search my heart, oh God. Know my heart. Let my meditations be before you. And as David said, may the words of my heart or my mouth, the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight to learn to think before God. And so that's where meditation takes us. Ultimately, we get in the habit of thinking before God in everything that we do. Notice in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 5, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing, that word is not like argument, like, you know, you're going back and forth. It's the reasons. It's like a mathematical argument. You're having the proofs, the reasons why. Casting down everything, every thought that we have, reason, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So the practice of meditation is drawing near to God so that what's really happening is now all the thoughts that we have are being brought into captivity to him. That is the spiritual power of meditation is that we get in a habit. We are training ourselves to think as if we're thinking right before God. And that really is where the whole transformation takes place. When he says, do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, proving what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It is having that heart to say, your way is the best way. What you think, I want to think. The way you see the world is the way I want to see the world. God, share your heart. Make me wiser than my enemies. Make me to know more than those that are older than me. Let your word teach me and instruct me so that what happens is this power of God is to get us in a habit where every thought we have is set before him. That's how you take a thought into captivity to Christ. You set every thought before him. And when you see it's tending to sinfulness, you acknowledge the sinfulness. You repent of the sinfulness. You say, this, God, this is what just came in my mind, but this is not what I want. I want you. And then you add his word. You defeat the thought by the word. So if the tendency comes, you say, I'm thinking of lying right now. I'm thinking of, no, God says, I hate lying. If God hates lying, I hate lying. And you use the word of God to defeat the thought that your flesh might have. And now you're gaining in that walk in the spirit because you're willing to choose God over your own thoughts. Make the tree good and its fruit good. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. So if you fill your mind with the things that God thinks, what's going to come out of your mouth and really what's going to come out of all your actions is going to be based on that word. You are deprogramming yourself from the world. You're saying, I do not want to be conformed to the world. I want to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. That's really what meditation is, a transformation 
that takes place because of obedience to God to meditate. And then finally, meditating on your role in Christ. 1 Timothy 4, verses 12 to 16 says, Meditate on these things and give yourself entirely to them. One is, be an example to the believers in word, conduct, love, spirit, faith, and purity. How often do you meditate on that? It's a really clear command in scriptures to meditate on your example as a believer. Meditate on your example as a believer and being an example, meditate on how you are an example in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. Meditate on that. Why would God want us to meditate on that? Because he wants us to be that. You meditate on it and how to do it because God wants you to be that. Then it says, give attention to reading, exhortation, and doctrine. Meditate on paying attention to reading, exhortation, and doctrine. Meditate on how do I do that? When am I doing that? How do I take time to do that? And then third, do not neglect the gift given to you. Meditate on what God has given you and use that to change your life, to change your mind. Meditate on your role in Jesus Christ. So today we've covered four points on meditation. One is to meditate on God's goodness. Second, on his law and word. Third, on the power of our sin and, and your role in Christ. And we just end here with this Psalm 104, 34. It says, may my meditation be sweet to him. My friends, this is probably one of the most important of the, the practices that you can have in your life. We talk about prayer, so important. Talk about uh, Bible study, so important. But it's meditation that comes both as a fruit of prayer and Bible study as well as it leads to further Bible study and further prayer. But it, it also is what then makes you a blessing in your fellowship. When we come to this church, we come to stir up one another to love and to good works and how we do that is we spend our time filling ourselves up with God, with his word and his ways, so that we can share that goodness with others. We can share his word and his law with others. And that is our responsibility. As believers, every one of us has a role in Jesus Christ to be an example in love, in word, in faith. Every one of us has this opportunity to become more like Christ through the practice of meditation. So I hope that you will think about these things. I hope that you will practice them. And I hope that you will set time in your life to realize the importance of just shutting off that television, shutting off life, and taking some time just to think about God, who he is, and all of his perfect ways.